Yes. Yes. Good. That's good. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Myra Harrison, uh, Superintendent for the National Park Service for the Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters, National Historic Site. We also manage two other National Historic Sites in Brooklyn, the Frederick Law Homestead National Historic Site and the John Fitzgerald Kennedy National Historic Site. And we hope that you will visit them as well. Uh, well we're very excited about this lecture this evening, A Journey of Instruction uh, by Dr. Robert Selle. And uh, let me speak to how he comes to us this evening. Uh, he, of course, knew of uh, Rochambeau's visit to this house and spoke to me about it at an event of which we both attended in June, honoring a longstanding colleague and friend, Barry Gall, for his significant work on behalf of the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route National Historic Trail. And he arrives at the precise moment of my mentioning his uh, recently being honored by Lord Gallagher in France. Um, and Dr. Selig uh, let me know at that time uh, that Rochambeau had in fact visited this house. This was something of which we were vaguely, but not specifically aware, and that uh, began an email correspondence in which he shared with us the documentation that this occasion had in fact occurred, <coughs> and everyone here is very excited about that, and to learn about this dimension of the of Revolutionary War history of this house, for which we, uh, of course, have enormous interest uh, and deep care and stewardship commitment. So let me just say that this evening we have a number of co-sponsors of this lecture along with the National Park Service, uh, the Friends of the Longfellow House, uh, George Washington's Headquarters National Historic Site, our co-sponsors, uh, as is the Massachusetts Lafayette <coughs> Society and the Washington Roshan <coughs> Revolutionary Group National Historic Trail, and I'm expecting by the end of the evening, this will just flow from my lips. <laughs> you know, I have to look for prompts every other minute as I do at present. Um, I would like first to introduce um, Mr. Alan Hoffman, who is the president of the Massachusetts Lafayette Society, to say a few words. And uh, then he will be followed by Paul Kelly, <coughs> who is the trail manager for that route that I will not force us all to listen to. It's a long title of. Uh, and he will introduce uh, Dr. Selling. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, thanks to the staff <coughs> here for all they have done to put this uh, evening's event on. And um, you will be invited by Beth Weir, who is the site manager, to what perhaps even in uh, Washington's time would have been a slight collation at the end of the, uh, end of the lecture. <laughs> <clears throat> to uh, Superintendent uh, Harrison, I just want to say a few words uh, in two capacities. I'm the president of the Massachusetts Lafayette <laughs> Society, and, as well as being a uh, director and I think I'm third <coughs> vice president of the W3R US and head of the Massachusetts chapter. Um, so, um, the, as, as Superintendent Harrison said, there are several sponsors of this event. The Friends of the Longfellow House, the Massachusetts La Lafayette Society, the National Park Service, National Historic Trail, and the W3R US, which is a little bit different but the same as the National Trail. It, it's a private organization. It worked for many years since 1999 to get the trail established as a national historic trail. I would say it's analogous to the Friends, at this point it's analogous to the Friends of the Longfellow House. Now you will hear from Dr. Selig, I'm not going to introduce him directly, but I will explain to you that he has been working uh, on a contract to document the roots in Massachusetts of the French Army. And um, basically Massachusetts has been kind of an orphan in the W3R uh, US, I even have trouble saying W3R US, uh, but now we're, we're, we're legitimating Massachusetts by having this research done. The research uh, itself is sponsored by the W3R US and the National Park Service and by 
the uh, Massachusetts uh, chapter of the Society of the Cincinnati. So I want to give them credit as well. And I will turn the program now over to a representative of the National Historic Trail who came here uh, to be with us from Philadelphia, Paul Kenny. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. <coughs> um, the uh, Washington Rochambeau Trail, or the W3R Trail, uh, as we, I probably should have mentioned that to you. The trail was actually designated by Congress in 2009. Um, the legislation is, is, is fairly loose, but it, it does rely very much on the creation of some planning documents. We're in the middle of writing those planning documents now. They're in draft. Uh, hopefully within six months they'll be finished, and we'll have a, a clearer idea of how the, the trail will be mapped out and we'll have identified all the sites that uh, really beg for interpretation, and there's some, some very good ones. Right now, uh, I'm actually on detail in this program. Um, I've only been on for about five weeks, uh, but I have um, I've, I've done a great deal of reading Dr. Selig's work. It's very detailed, comes in three volumes, and, and the, it's just incredible the, the, the complexity and the sophistication of that military mobilization that led to Yorktown. Uh, it's taken a good deal of my time just in the first couple weeks going through those volumes and getting a better idea of what happened in 1781 and all the way to 82 and then at the end of the war. Uh, the, the trail itself uh, has two people working on it full time, myself and the superintendent, Joe DeBello, out of Philadelphia, Philadelphia's Northeast Regional Office of the National Park Service. Uh, Joe's been working on the project really since about 2009 to, into 2010. Uh, we do have a brochure in the back. Uh, before you leave, you'll want to grab one. Uh, it's, it's a very well-produced document uh, in itself. Uh, a couple initiatives. Right now, we seem to be focused more on New Jersey, uh, simply because there is a, a national heritage area there, uh, and it's called Crossroads of the American Revolution. Uh, New Jersey, most historians tend to think it's kind of like Virginia was to the Civil War. It's really where much of the action was with the British in New York City. And we're, we're matching up a lot of resources, uh, a lot of the story with the Crossroads folks. Uh, and we're going to continue doing that into the spring. Um, and lastly, what we're working on more recently is the Ermion, uh, the French frigate, the replica that's going to be coming, touring the East Coast this summer. Uh, Joe DeVello and I are on the, on the committee uh, working uh, out the logistics of that visit. Uh, and it'll start in Yorktown in June and will end in Nova Scotia uh, in late July. Uh, so far, it's slated for two days in Boston. Uh, but there are lots of details with the logistics of the, of the trip and the interpretation. The Park Service will, will take a role in interpreting that event. Uh, especially with the Franco-American Alliance, Rochambeau, and of course Lafayette. So um, that's pretty much it from the, the Park Service perspective in working on this trail. Um, I've, I've really come to rely and really uh, uh, just am, am bowled over by the by the amount of research Dr. Selig did on this trail. Uh, it's really it's really top notch, uh, but it is it's voluminous. Um, and, but it's really a joy to go through, and uh, hopefully we'll nail down as much of the, of the documentation as we can in this management plan we're developing through that research. So without uh, further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Selly. Uh, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, thank you for sponsoring the Longfellow House here. Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, 
in this uh, too cold Massachusetts <laughs> December uh, weather. It's uh, a pleasure to see uh, uh, Larry Gall again, whom I went. Uh, we started back in what 2000, and Larry said when he got this position as startup manager for the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route National Historic Trail, for the first time he needed to use both sides of his business card to get <laughs> out there together with all these other titles that you have right uh, uh, in there. Uh, as uh, as uh, was mentioned, I've been working on this for a, uh, well over 10 years. And as we are as we are doing this, it's amazing the, uh, what is still out there, what still can be found, and uh, that hadn't been known. And uh, uh, another year or two, when this is done, then I'm going to go in my retirement job, and this is doing bus tours uh, up and down the East Coast, and we stop at every historic tavern. <laughs> <laughs> and there are actually quite a few uh, of those there. Uh, the title of my presentation is A Journey of Instruction, and I'd like to thank uh, uh, Garrett Ranger Kuzov there for, uh, for coming up with this title, because it gives me a wonderful, uh, a wonderful start uh, and, and into, this, into this presentation that I want to do. Because on the 13th of December, 1780, the Comte de Rochambeau wrote to George Washington from Boston, and I quote, I came here to make a journey of instruction and to admire the brilliant campaign which Your Excellency made in this quarter, to which uh, Washington replied on the 23rd of December, uh, 10 days later, if Your Excellency's tour to Boston was solely to view with a view to improvement, perhaps it is to our advantage that you will have found few traces of works hastily thrown up by very inexperienced soldiers, and which, were they standing, would only serve to betray our ignorance of military matters at that time of day. I said this gives me a, a nice uh, entry into this, what I want to talk about today, because Rochambeau's journey of instruction <laughs> to Boston and Washington's response <coughs> to it about these very inexperienced <coughs> soldiers illustrate, uh, hopefully, I think, uh, a much longer and broader journey uh, of these two men and the two powers that they actually represent. Because by 17, December of 1780, these two powers had been on a journey of mutual instruction, of mutual learning of each other. A journey that had begun with military assistance in 1775, 76, with instruction in the art of war, the, the uh, Continental Army's engineering department, map makers, artillery, they're all French or European uh, experts, goes on to a cooperation in campaigns and battles, some turning out better than others, thinking of, the, uh, of Newport, for example, and last but not least, a journey of getting to know each other as, as individuals as well as, as countries, of course. And it was a journey that had begun with very inexperienced soldiers in July of 1775. But if, if Washington goes and the Continental Army goes through a process of learning, this is clearly obvious when we go from 1775 <coughs> to Saratoga, 77, Savannah, 79, Cornwallis, October of 1781. And it is also a journey that stretches the whole east coast of the United States. It's a journey that goes all the way out to uh, Niles, uh, Michigan, just a couple miles from where I live. It's a, it's a journey, if you put it in a global context, that includes the Jersey Isles, it goes to San Domingue, it goes to Mobile, Alabama, uh, to Cuddalore, Senegal, Nicaragua, etc. And it is also a journey that saw France marching side by side with the United States from day one. Literally from day one. Because Lexington and Concord is when? April 1775. And in September of 1775, 
the British Charge d'Affaires in Paris is already protesting shipment of gunpowder from Saint-Domingue. Give the time lapse on what it takes, this powder had been on, on its way in April of 1775 mm -hmm. already. It is also a journey that most Americans had hoped that the French would join them in. Uh, it is a journey that the French uh, had, that the Americans had hoped the French would join them in, which is one of the reasons why the Americans declared, Congress declared independence when they did. Because the colonists uh, had started this fight with Great Britain penniless, without artillery, without equipment, without knowledge, without arms and supplies. And they also knew that this aid could only come from France. But they also knew that it would only come if these colonists would declare their independence. In January of 1776, Thomas Paine had written in Common Sense that nothing can settle our affairs so expeditiously as an open and determined declaration of independence, because neither France nor Spain will give us any kind of assistance while we profess ourselves the subjects of Britain. And even John Adams, who privately thought that most Catholics had horn and cloven feet, admitted in his autobiography that we should be driven to the necessity of declaring ourselves independent states and treaties to be proposed to foreign powers, particularly to France, together with the Declaration of Independence. Because these three measures, independence, confederation, and negotiation with foreign powers, particularly France, ought to go hand in hand and be adopted all together." End of quote. So in other words, independent, the United States had, or these colonies had always looked to France to join them in this march, in this journey of instruction, in this battle for, for uh, independence. Because the Declaration of Independence is, is, is not addressed to the American people. I mean, here in, in Massachusetts, we have Worcester that already declared themselves more or less independent. Rhode Island had declared itself independent. After Lexington and Concord, the King of England didn't need to be told anymore that these colonists want to be independent. It is really addressed to France and to a lesser degree to Spain, the candid world. Yeah, we need, we need you, why don't you join us? And it is also a journey of instruction and the third point that since March of 1780, is, uh, March of 1980 is known as the W3R. And Washington's visit, or rather Rochambeau's visit, to the Longfellow House here, uh, even if ever so short, in December of 1780, is part of this journey of, of instruction, this journey of, that eventually leads to independence. It's a crucial stop, stop on this National Historic Trail, commemorating the crucial role, role played by France in all of this. Now, I don't want to get go into the whole background, why they're coming, when they're coming, uh, etc. Where does the journey begin? Where does this end? I just want to look at a small section of this trail, and that is here, uh, Rochambeau's visit to, uh, to uh, Boston. And maybe I can even suggest a couple points of your own journey of instruction about the French in Boston, or French, uh, French Boston. The starting point I think, and uh, it's a very fitting starting point for this journey, is uh, with the Marquis de Lafayette. Why is this a fitting starting point for this journey here, for this National Historic Trail? It is because it is Lafayette who brings the news that uh, French forces, that the, that the Comte de Rochambeau is coming to, to America. Uh, Lafayette arrives in Marblehead of Marblehead on the 27th of April, 1780, and uh, uh, that's where he first sets foot on American soil again for the fourth time. This is his fourth visit to or journey to the uh, to Boston. Eventually, Lafayette had departed on the Armion on the 10th of March, 1780. 
and accompanied by two officers, it is the me, for example, people who have come uh, to prepare for the arrival of Rochambeau's uh, supply officers, quartermasters, etc. Uh, Sales on the 14th of March 1780, around 3 p.m. from La Rochelle on the Hermione, and as we have heard, the Hermione will come probably, hopefully, to Boston on the 11th of 12th uh, of July of next year. Here's a more recent photo. I like this picture uh, better. It's just the flag is kind of from the we need flag. To, <laughs> we need to paint over the flag. <laughs> Uh, the journey was not without problems, just like the return of the army on next year uh, is, because uh, a day after the departure of the main yard arm broke, and she has to return back to the, the island of A, where the frigate La Galate has to part with her yard arm. And by the 20th of March, the Chevalier de la Touche, the commanding officer of the uh, of the uh, uh, Mion, uh set sail for Boston, and after a very fast journey of about 37, 37 days, I make a better door than window, don't I? After a very fast journey of about 37 days, uh, uh, as I said, the, the Amion is off the coast of, uh, of Massachusetts at Marblehead, where General John Glover comes on board to welcome Lafayette to the, to the New World. And Glover and Lafayette have known each other for a long time already, Brandywine, uh, for example. And uh, Lafayette spends the first night in Turner Glover's home, which is still standing uh, up there uh, even, even today. Uh, Lafayette is back on board the army on 6 a.m. on the 28th of April, and then they set sail for Boston, where he arrives at Hancock's Wharf in the early afternoon, and Hancock's Wharf is up there at the, at the very top, obviously. And, uh, and uh, at 3 p.m., as the log of the Armion states, Lafayette disembarks to three Vivre Roi and a 13-gun salute, and he is welcomed uh, uh, joyfully in Boston. Uh, uh, his arrival uh, and his and, uh, reception are reported in every newspaper up and down the coast. Uh, we have we have bonfires, we have gun salutes. The leadership of the city of Boston is there to uh, to uh, welcome him and what have you. Lafayette himself describes his reception in a letter to his wife from Waterbury, Connecticut, on the sixth of May. I disembarked afternoon in the midst of an immense crowd. They welcomed me with the roar of guns, the ringing of all the city's bells, the music of a band that marched ahead of us, and the hussars of all the people that surrounded us. And in this way, I was led to the house of that the council and the assembly of representatives of Boston had prepared for me. And there was a deputation from these bodies to welcome come me, and in the evening the people gathered in front of my door and built a great bonfire with much cheering that lasted until after midnight. Uh, there was a bigger event than the annual burning of the Pope. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, the house where, uh, where Lafayette stayed was at Mrs. Fraser's in State Street, and uh, I'm uh, uh, grateful to David Newman for, provide, for providing this uh, image uh, to me that suitable accommodations for the marquee and his suit be provided at Mrs. Fraser's State Street, uh, etc. The problem is, the question is, where was the house of Mrs. Fraser on State Street? Uh, uh, here <coughs> is State Street, Oops. yeah, here is State Street 1801. And uh, the, it is here on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side is the uh, grapes, the tavern of grapes. And the right-hand side is where it was, and it's right here. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and you all know where this is, the United States Street. Uh, and here's Mr. Hoffman, one of the <laughs> authorities, ancient and modern, that I consulted yeah, during What's a, cold that day, I remember. <laughs> it was December. Come on. Uh, so this is where, uh, where, uh, where Lafayette stayed in Boston until the 2nd of May. And that's when, then, that's when he set out for, uh, for Morristown. And since uh, we decided, or we are, are dis discussing right now, to start, chronologically start this National Historic Trail with the arrival of Lafayette, of course, then we need to look at how we traveled uh, from here uh, today uh, to Morristown. Now, you only leave a trail or a trace if you're either really, really good or really, really bad. In the case of Lafayette, uh, he's really, really good, and so the newspapers report on him, and this is how we can trace his route from Boston to Watertown, uh, then uh, Marlboro, Brookfield, south to Hartford, where he possibly spent the night with Jeremiah Wadsworth. Wadsworth Athenaeum is named after him. And then from Hartford, Lafayette, Lafayette took what's known as the lower route through, uh, through uh, Fishkill, Newburg and Waterbury to, uh, uh, to uh, Newburgh eventually, where he is on the 8th of May, on the other side of the river. Now on the, on the other side of the river he has two options of how to get to Morristown. He can either go uh, roughly 9W202 <coughs> along the Hudson, or he can take what's known as the Continental Road uh, through uh, uh, the, the Continental uh, Road through Slotesboro, <coughs> Ringwood, uh, and down to Pompton. We know that he took the Continental Road along Toxino Lake to Ringwood to Pompton. Why do we know that? Because Washington had written him a letter where he says that Major Gibbs will go as far as Pompton, where the roads unite uh, to meet you and will proceed from thence as distances may direct. You should never write a letter if you're Washington and send it there because what has happened? The British knew about it and we know therefore that uh, General Kniphausen was waiting for Lafayette as uh, General Robertson, James Robertson, writes to Henry Clinton, Sir Henry Clinton on the 18th of May, that Lafayette has very nearly escaped a party General Kniphausen sent to intercept him at the Clove uh, there. Uh, but uh, he made it to, uh, to Morristown <coughs> and informed uh, Washington that uh, Rochambeau was coming. By the time he tells Rochambeau, uh, Washington that Rochambeau is coming, Rochambeau and his forces are, of course, already on their way in the middle of the uh, ocean. And they sail because Rochambeau and his forces sail into Newport Harbor on the 11th of July, 1780 or at least most of them. I want to show you some uh, uniforms here. Uh, Bourbonnois, or Le Pont, saint Ange, and Soissonat. And we actually have a grenadier from the saint Ange uh, regiment here today. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, and uh, we also have artillery, of course, uh, with the, with the uh, uh, Ouvrier. The, uh, uh, the part of the artillery, the 600 men artillery detachment that comes. I said <coughs> uh, Rochambeau's troops sail into Newport on the 11th of July, or at least most of them. Uh, uh, how many of them are there, by the way? There are roughly 5,200. Uh, it's uh, roughly 52. Uh, 5,200. Uh, a review on the review of Manila papers. This is July 1780. This is the review of September 1780. By December, uh, 1st December, roughly 200 uh, of these men have died by the time they embark on their uh, on their campaign to Yorktown. At least 325 enlisted <coughs> men have uh, died of natural uh, causes such as scurvy, uh, drowning, and, and general weakness, and what have you. 
<clears throat> Not all of them. Where do they die? Some of them. Uh, most of them die in Newport and Providence, but not all of them. Because one vessel, the Ile de France, uh, gets lost and ends up in Boston. Yeah? This is from the journal of uh, Lobedier, who is an aide de camp to Washington, to, to Rochambeau, and he said uh, that on the 24th of August we learned that Ile de France has put into Boston. And that, that quelques hommes malades, that some of them are sick, actually Blanchard uh, uh, estimates that about 100 of these 350 men in Boston are sick, 12 of them die and are buried in Boston. Mm -hmm. Where? At the King's Chapel. Uh, that's at least one, and that's, that's, the an one. that's the answer that I usually get, you know, where are friends buried in Boston? Well, it's King's Chapel. Uh, King's Chapel here, the Chevalier de Saint Sauveur, uh, 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 who is in Comte de Saint's uh, uh, fleet, and we have this old bakery incident, and then the day after uh, his death, the General Assembly votes uh, to erect a memorial that is eventually unveiled, <coughs> unveiled in 1917. Uh, nothing moves fast at <laughs> uh, uh, any point. But this is clearly, obviously, part of a different journey of instruction uh, in 1778, a journey of instruction that by far didn't go by far as well as the one that we have in 1780, <coughs> of course. It's mostly personalities. And here again, uh, we see the importance of people like Lafayette. Uh, on the 5th of November, 1778, uh, Destin, uh, and here's a picture of this, uh, uh, wrote to Gabriel de Sartin, the naval minister, and I quote, In America, one must also fawn to the height of insipidity over every little Republican who regards <laughs> flattery as his sovereign right. <laughs> Hold command over captains who are not good enough company to be permitted to eat with their general officers and have colonels who are innkeepers at the same time. <laughs> It is, however, it is his knowing how to turn all that to advantage, to put it in its place and remain in his own that has most impressed me in the difficulties that Monsieur le Marquis de Lafayette has overcome. And here we clearly see how important personalities. Yes, he says, okay, if this is how, what I have to do, I will do it. And this is where also where, where the choice of, of Rochambeau to command this expedition <coughs> is so important. Uh, Rochambeau was a great uh, diplomat when it came to dealing uh, with, with the Americans, much more so than many of his officers uh, are clearly. They clearly were not prepared to fawn over every little Republican. Uh, uh, but this is that this uh, sense of her, and this is the only one that comes up when people say we know, well, this is where a Frenchman is buried. Some people will know that there's a French uh, cemetery and a marker over on the island of Hull, or half island of Hull, uh, over here in Nantucket. It was put up in 1976, uh, and again, I got the photograph from uh, Mr. Uh, no, no, from David. Where, uh, but back to the Bourbonnois. In the summer of 1780, uh, Boston isn't exactly dotted with Catholic churches and priests and cemeteries. And where would they be buried? I mean, I've talked to uh, uh, Don Bell and other people, and I guess uh, uh, what the, bear, the central burying ground here is as good a guess as any. Uh, others were Old North Dorchester came up, uh, different suggestions, but we simply don't know, and I don't know that there are burial records uh, for these uh, cemeteries out there. But since we have the dozens, eventually there will be over 30 <coughs> French soldiers alone that die in Boston, they have to be buried uh, somewhere. So there's some, you know, some room for some research still uh, in this area. Because the 12 men from the Bourbon are not the last people, as I said, they will be buried in 
in Boston. Now by November, 1780 French forces going to winter quarters. Going to, yeah. going to winter quarters uh, and on the 11th of December, Rochambeau also decides it's time to travel. He's pretty much the last one to uh, go out on a journey. Uh, Chateloup has left already uh, traveling. Uh, the uh, Comte de Dupont, Will, uh, Christian de Dupont, is down in, in Philadelphia actually recruiting among Hessians for the regiment de Dupont from Zweibrücken. Uh, we got Christine and others that end up all the way down in Monticello, mm -hmm. sending letters from Yorktown uh, on, a fr on French vessels <coughs> to France. They're spread out all over all over the, the continent. Uh, and so Rochambeau, who has just done a uh, uh, reconnaissance with Wyndham, Lebanon, Hartford, that area, decides he wants to go to see uh, Boston. And he is accompanied by uh, Brigadier uh, Gabriel de Choisy. Uh, Choisy may seem is one of these French officers who is virtually unknown uh, here in the United States. Uh, and it's also a strange choice for Rochambeau to pick him, but I think he's the only general officer, any officer of any rank that he could have taken with him because he's second in command, uh, uh, Baron de Villemanil has to stay in Newport, so he goes, uh, he takes uh, him. Choisy actually had wanted to be in Rochambeau's uh, ex expeditionary corps, had been turned down, so he gets on a ship and sails to uh, saint Domingue to Haiti, and from there up to Newport and says, here I am. And then Rochambeau wouldn't really send him back. Uh, he has good connections. Uh, he's fought in Poland in 1772, 1773. It's one of these uh, people who have been all over the world, just basically uh, uh, fighting their way from one battle to another and <coughs> never having, always having the good fortune not to get killed. Who else accompanies uh, Rochambeau? We don't know. Not a single one of his aides acknowledges or admits that he accompanied them. I mean, uh, Fersen, Baron Closen, uh, Gromont de Bourg, uh, du Boucher, nobody uh, says he accompanied uh, Rochambeau. Uh, there's a one journal by the Conde de la May where whose whereabouts are unknown, maybe it's in there. But it's unthinkable that these two generals would have traveled all by themselves. <laughs> But I haven't found any any evidence uh, uh, of that there was anybody who helped uh, Rochambeau to get undressed at night or dressed in the morning. Uh, be that as it may, uh, we know that Rochambeau, and here we have two uh, portraits of him. Here is Rochambeau, and here is a French officer in the uh, in the uniform of a <coughs> lieutenant general. Uh, Rochambeau probably didn't have this on on the journey because it was bitter cold at the time. Uh, the journey was most likely through Providence, Attleboro, Random, Walpole, Dedham, and Roxbury. And the reason why I say this is because uh, you know that, uh, that uh, Admiral Ternay dies and Rochambeau has to cut his visit short to Boston. And, and the Conde Lobedier, uh, uh, whom I just quoted, uh, is the one who is sent to Boston to uh, tell Rochambeau, and he says, I follow the route that Rochambeau had taken. Uh, it is uh, treacherous, I think roads have gotten better since then, uh, because at one point uh, in the cold and the snow, uh, actually his horse slips and he falls down and his horse is on top of him and his, his aide uh, servant helps him get out from under his horse, which again makes me think that Rochambeau and, and Trussi didn't just travel by by themselves, but this is the journey that he says, uh, the route that he says that he took, and uh, in uh, Boston he stayed with Governor Hancock. Uh, there is the, you know, you all know where where uh, this is. Now, news, uh, newspaper, Boston newspapers uh, cover <laughs> obviously the visit. Uh, of uh, Rochambeau to Boston, but the story is covered all the way down to Philadelphia, uh, down to Baltimore, up and down the whole East Coast, uh, with a certain time lapse we read. And, and <coughs> fortunately, they, they don't all uh, perhaps contain the same information. 
Last Saturday morning, that's the 16th of uh, December, <coughs> right? Rochambeau uh, comes with Choisy, uh, and uh, then visiting on the two following days the castle, Bunker Hill, the lines around Boston, Washington's former headquarters at Cambridge, <coughs> and we are right here, obviously, and the university. That's uh, that's not MIT, right? <laughs> Further up the river. <laughs> that's the other one. Watch it. Did I say that right? <laughs> okay. Uh, every respect. This is like Michigan State and U of M. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Only that they have the better football teams. Okay. The general and count Choisy resided in the house of the governor. And the Pennsylvania Journal uh, tells us that uh, that on Friday last, His Excellency went and viewed the works at the castle when, when he was received with a salute from the canon of the fortress. So if he went to the castle out in the harbor on Friday, he must have been here on Thursday, which puts his visit to the 14th of December, 1780, which would be hmm. tomorrow, mm -hmm. 200 and a couple of years uh, ago, uh, obviously. These are, this was the, the primary source that I had of, of uh, Rochambeau's visit actually here to, uh, and since this is not the Boston Globe, we can believe every word. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of the places that he visited, uh, the castle here, Castle Williams, obviously, uh, 1777, uh, the university, uh, Harvard uh, University, <coughs> here, there, I said it. Uh, and then, of course, the headquarters here at Cambridge. We know that in December of 1780, this building was still owned by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts because uh, the Commonwealth, which had uh, uh, confiscated it from uh, John Vassal in the fall of 1778 and sold in the spring of 1781, uh, it's just as well that Rochambeau came in December of 1780, another couple of months later, because otherwise he might have uh, been a participant in this memorable dinner given to French naval officers by the new owner, Nathaniel Tracy. That dinner, right, the occasion for this dinner is the arrival of Admiral Barra uh, in Boston on the 8th of May aboard La Concorde, and, and the Barrow replaced the technique was died. This dinner is described by Samuel Brick. Samuel Brick, who lives in this house, which is where? Anyone know this? Philadelphia. Samuel Brick? Philadelphia. This is, this is uh, Sweetbriar. You spoke there, didn't you? Yes, I spoke in a different place. Yeah, this is Sweetbriar, They're the home of Brick, who would tell us the story, and Lafayette stays there in 1824, 1825, when he's there. So we have a Philadelphia uh, connection uh, here as well, and what what uh, what Samuel Brick describes is that uh, that the admiral sat at the right of Tracy and Monsieur de Leton is the French consul on the left, uh, and Tracy filled a plate with soup, which went to the admiral and the next was handed to, to the consul. As soon as the consul had put his spoon into his plate. He fished up a large frog, <laughs> just as green and perfect as if he had hopped from the pond into the terrain. Not knowing at first what he was, he seized it by one of his hind legs, and holding it up in view of the whole company, discovered that he was indeed a full-grown frog. As soon as he had thoroughly inspected it, he exclaimed, Mon Dieu, un grenouille. Then turning to the gentleman next to him, gave the frog to him, and he goes round and round. And meanwhile, Tracy kept his tail going, wondering what his outlandish guests meant by such extravagant merriment. What's the matter, asked he, and raising his head, surveyed the frogs dangling by a leg in all directions. Why don't they eat them? If they knew the confounded trouble I had to catch them in order to treat them to a dish of their own country, they would find that with me at last it was no choking 
matter. <laughs> Why am I quoting this? Not to get a, a you know, cheap laughter at the expense of the French, but as an example of how, how little the two sides knew of each other. Uh, when, when, when the stand comes here in 1778, uh, there is a report that I could uh, quote you that Americans are surprised that these French are actually fairly well fed and, you know, and, and you know, just, look just like normal people do. The, the amount of, of, of <coughs> ignorance and prejudice that's out there is incredible. And, and, and this getting to know each other is which takes starts in 1778 and goes through 1780, but then repeats itself as these forces march from Boston all the way to Yorktown, through Connecticut, through New York, through New Jersey, through communities that had never met a Frenchman. Germans, yes, maybe some Dutch, whatever else is out there, but not a Frenchman. This getting to know each other is crucial for the for Americans finding who they are. Because you can, it's much easier to define who you are if you can say, well, and we are this because we're not that. Uh, and this is something that, uh, that I think this National Historic Trail, one of the focuses of this trail is how important this is, not just for winning victory, but also for Americans to become aware of who they are because of who they are not, which is also one of the reasons why I encourage all of my children to study abroad. I mean, they had a stay there or want to go back. Anyway, here we have uh, a, uh, a, uh, a visit here, uh, 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 the place where Bragg lived here in, in, uh, in, this in the early 18th century, the gentleman who uh, told this wonderful story. Uh, Lobadier stays in, in, uh, in uh, Boston for a couple of days and he most likely comes here and tell, uh, talks about the house. Uh, he's not the last one. There's a French engineer by the name of Oye Ray. Comes in January of 1781. Captain Oye Ray comes to Boston, describes the defenses, goes to Cambridge, sees the university there and the library. Most likely he came here as well. He just doesn't say so. Then he travels on to Salem, Portsmouth, uh, into Maine. In other words, this is there's hardly anybody left in, in uh, Newport there. They're traveling all <laughs> over. And then through eight, throughout 1780 and 1781, Boston remains a preferred port of entry, including the 11th of July, 1781, when a convoy of eight vessels accompanied by the 50-gun uh, ship, the Sakitea, carrying 50, 592 infantry replacements and artillery arrive. And again, over a hundred of these men are sick as well, and at least three of the uh, artillery are known to have died here. And this is what these sources in this French control look like. Uh, here's the name usually on the left. This is, sorry, this is from a microfilm, uh, where I copied this. And then here on the right hand side, it says, Moi, uh, l'hôpital de Boston, died in a hospital in Boston, uh, 25th of July, 17. Uh, 81, here's another one. So for these people, we have uh, the names, the ages, the places, the units, etc., where they are, where they die, and and when. This man is you know, 21, 21 uh, years old. Uh, this is just one example. Uh, July 1781, without any other description, unfortunately, of uh, the visit here that I have found so far, Rosenbaum just as well went to Boston and uh, and uh, uh, looked around and came back. Uh, we know that French forces go down <coughs> to uh, go down to uh, Yorktown, and 18 months later, in early December 1782, they are back. Except Lausanne's Legion, they don't come back up here, and they are ready to embark on the vessels of Admiral Baudreuil that have been lying in Boston Harbor since the 10th of August of 1782. Here's a map of this, of, of uh, uh, the fleet of Woodrow in Boston Harbor. Here, these are the, the vessels. Here's a group and here's another group. 
at anchor. Here's George's Island, you know where that is, obviously. Here's the Magnifique, that ship that wrecked on the 13th of August, 1782. Uh, uh, as they're trying to get in, here's Castle William, uh, where Rochambeau is. Clearly, on Long Island, there is a French hospital, uh, uh, but that's for the Navy uh, only. And I also have some, some names of, of sailors that die there, and most likely, the other ones then are uh, buried over at Hull. So for this French uh, uh, cemetery there, you should put some names uh, to it. And anyway, so the French fleet Vaudreuil is in the, in the harbor here since 1781, and then until uh, 14th of August when three, uh, when three uh, of the of Vaudreuil's vessels sail up to Portsmouth, the Auguste La Bourgogne and Pluton. Uh, here's a drawing of the Ogres <coughs> from the log of uh, from of the log of Lieutenant Lieutenant de Frigat de Vienne. Every French naval officer is required to keep a journal besides the official log that is being kept. Uh, in this case, these logs have survived uh, due to an unfortunate incident on the 12th of April, 1782, known as the Battle of the Saints. Uh, but these logs then became uh, evidence for the court-martial of Admiral de Grasse, and that's why we have them. I think uh, these, these, uh, these <coughs> logs, especially this one, and there's about half a dozen of them, are extremely, uh, extremely detailed, uh, and this is probably the source for the presence of French, of French forces in Boston that is the least used, and so they have never <coughs> seen it used. Now, the, the, so the sailors uh, are not allowed to actually get off the vessels all too often. There's this unfortunate incident with saint Sauveur for one thing, but much more importantly, once you let them off the boat, they don't come back. <laughs> because what do they do? They all hire in French, on American privateers. There's so much more money to be made you know, on a privateer, you're on a ship, and, and you know, off you go. Uh, uh, in the, but the officers uh, are, are allowed to get off. And there are some, some wonderful descriptions of meetings with people in Boston. Same up in Portsmouth, one of the journal Theoshis has a description of a dinner with the, with the folks, with the mayor and town council up in Portsmouth, etc., in the uh, drawings, etc. This is a source that at least I have not never seen or uh, used to any great extent. And you don't have to go very far. Unfortunately, you don't get to go to Paris for this because they were in the Library of Congress. Uh, 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 so they got to, to, uh, to uh, Portsmouth, uh, these three vessels. And then on the 6th and 7th of, de of December, French forces embarked, but shortly thereafter they disembarked again uh, and a house in way houses along the docks. <coughs> this is a receipt for the hire of a large store on Long Wharf uh, for magazine by Samuel Hamlin. This is from the, out of the Jeremiah Wattsworth papers. And the uh, Jeremiah Wattsworth, Jeremiah Wattsworth is the chief supplier of the, of the of French forces in America, which is why he ends up the richest man in Connecticut after the war. Uh, but there are thousands of these receipts from up and down the whole East Coast, including here for Boston. I just want to show one of them. There are receipts for, for wood, for planks to make beds for French forces, uh, supplies that come, uh, that come out, of, out of Roxbury, which is where the big supply station <coughs> is. Uh, Salem from all over, all over uh, New England, because in December of beginning in August of 1782 until December, how many people are on these ships that need to be fed? Probably close to 20,000, mm -hmm. which is the, uh, given the size of Boston of a little over 20,000. The strain on, on resources uh, has to be enormous. Uh, and so this is why it take supplies, firewood, <coughs> flour, cattle has to come from miles away, dozens of, of miles away. This is a problem uh, throughout the campaign. When you 
when you read <coughs> a receipt in the Wadsmouth paper from January of 1781 that, that Hollingsworth, for example, gets paid for having driven 250 fat cattle from Connecticut to Yorktown, you kind of wonder how fat they still are. <laughs> <laughs> By the time they get, they have marched, you know, 300, 400 miles in winter to get down there. Uh, this uh, this, this uh, issue of supplies is something that I really want to focus on too in this report then because it gives us a, an idea of how difficult uh, it would have been. Uh, uh, like corn, for example, on an ear of corn, how many kernels today? We don't eat, we eat corn in the Midwest, I don't know. <laughs> 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 they're, they're, they're between six and eight hundred today. When eight, in the 18th century, uh, 1780s, there were <coughs> about 50 uh, on there. And if you look at, at grain, uh, you know, uh, wheat, stock at maybe eight kernels, so today it's 40. Uh, and if you look at all of this, uh, uh, it's an interesting, uh, fascinating component of, that I want to uh, talk about in my report uh, as, as well. Vaudreuil brings money. I asked uh, Garrett uh, about how much money uh, 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 he wanted the loyalist compensation, the owner, and you said, well, he claimed about 11,000, right? And he eventually got 5000 for this whole property. Vaudreuil uh, submits <coughs> receipts for 190,000 pounds in expenses while he is in Boston. That had to be a huge boost for the economy. Uh, who says war is bad for business uh, uh, in this case? And we have this up and down the East Coast uh, as, as well. Uh, but that naval aspect and this supply aspect is uh, virtually unknown. And then, as I said, in the uh, in the uh, uh, in late December, uh, French forces reembark again on the fleet and getting ready to sail out. And now has come decision time for these soldiers, right? Decision time in what to what regards <coughs> to stay or go or go back. Now, uh, some stay simply because they die. <laughs> yeah. This one here, 28 years old when he dies. But look at this one, uh, Francois, okay. born in 1767, mm. enlisted in 1777, mm. dies in 1780. He's 13 years old, and you have that. Uh, I could show you uh, half a dozen or more of these little, of these entries uh, uh, that we have here. He's at least 28 years old when he dies here in Boston again. Uh, some stay because they want to stay. Here's one example of a cannoneer born in 1734, retires in Boston uh, in December of 1782 and stays here, uh, which is just as well if he had gone back to France. They would all be complaining about Hollande now. Uh, some, uh, however, don't have this option of retiring because they haven't been long enough, and so they desert. Uh, actually, some are left behind. This one, uh, Joseph Barton, uh, Resté, a l'hôpital in Boston, stays in a hospital in Boston in December 1782, right? Then the Rayet, they control, uh, such a race from the control, they have lost track of the man, he's somewhere over here. Uh, but uh, some of them <coughs> decide they would rather remain in the United States and desert. Uh, clearly, either 21st of December or 16th, they're not quite sure when this happened. Here we have an, even an NCO. We have people here inserts on the march, on the march actually to Boston. Uh, and that's dangerous. Not just because desertion is frowned upon, but uh, which church do those people go to? <laughs> They're mostly Catholic, obviously. Uh, that's uh, not a very hospitable uh, environment up here. Uh, Maryland probably would have been 
better. Which one of Rochambeau's units would you expect to have the largest number of deserters up here? Which one of these regiments gets the most friendly <coughs> environment? That's the home regiment from Zweibrücken, because they're, pardon? They're mostly Calvinist, mostly Calvinist or, or, uh, or Lutheran. But they don't wait to get to Boston. They've already gone, because they leave where? As soon as you get to Pennsylvania, or the other Pennsylvania Dutch. They're gone, uh, by the hundreds, literally, by the hundreds, literally. But there's one unit that has, and that might certainly surprise me, that has more than a dozen uh, people desert, and that's the smallest of Rochambeau's units, and that's the artillery. Uh, those are skilled people, artillerists, they know something about math, they know something about, uh, about cartography, etc., and they stay behind and found MIT. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I was surprised too that we, that the artillery had by far the largest number of deserters here in here in Boston, and it's and they're all Catholic. I mean, because the, these entries all all uh, uh, state. Uh, uh, certainly, in the Dupont regiment, they all state if they're not Catholic. Anyway, so they stayed behind, uh, but the rest sails out of Boston on Christmas Day, <coughs> and one uh, enlisted man, Daniel Floor of the Dupont Regiment, the German, uh, paints this last drawing of the last view of Boston as they sail out of Boston Harbor. Uh, it's clearly Boston because that's what? Because you've got a little... Uh, uh, grasshopper on top, yeah. not grasshopper, uh, yeah. Yeah. Grasshopper. Yeah. grasshopper, grasshopper on top here and then the harbor, uh, etc. Uh, and so they sail out of Boston never to come back. Uh, again, Rochambeau too had not come back, as we know, to Boston to complete his journey of instruction that he had started in December of 1780. Uh, uh, that had been interrupted by Admiral Ternay because, because Rochambeau turns around in Providence and sails out of Annapolis, picking up an honorary degree at the University of Pennsylvania along the way. This journey of instruction that I started uh, out with, this journey of getting to know each other, this journey of helping each other uh, financially, militarily, and uh, this journey of what became a journey of, of uh, sharing joint values, the values <coughs> of the American and the French Revolution, clearly becomes tighter as time uh, progresses. And I think it's a journey that is still uh, going on today. Rochambeau's visit to Boston and to the Longfellow <coughs> House here uh, constitutes an integral part of that journey of the old world, meeting the new, the old world bringing skills to the new world, but the values, the democratic values of the American French Enlightenment becoming reality over here, coming back to Europe then, be that in 1979, 1917, 1945, is a journey that still goes on. And if Roger Bow went on a journey of instruction and of learning, uh, maybe you got some ideas too of a journey of instruction through Boston that you can do <coughs> one of these days when it's warmer again. Thank you very much. <laughs> Superintendent, when do we have to be gone? Then we have some. Then we have some time for question. If somebody has a question, <coughs> I was light infantry on that picture. Now I'm heavy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, yes, I'll ask a question. Yeah. My name is Warren Little. I'm happy to. Uh, have supported this effort through the Massachusetts Society of Cincinnati. I'm happy to report that we will be 
uh, providing you with another check for two thousand dollars. So it should come in the next week. And of course, that leads to the question: Is what are you still going to be researching in this Boston contact? In the contact? Uh, there are three more aspects that I would like to uh, look at. One of them is. Uh, as really go through these naval logs uh, of all these vessels out there, because there are uh, there are uh, some some interesting uh, components of civilian military relations in there. There are sailors that flee the vessels uh, uh, and are brought back, things like that. Uh, the second component that I would like to look at then is more the Watchworth Papers in Hartford, Hartford and. I think there are 153 boxes <laughs> to give you an idea, and you always need to shower afterwards because yeah. you know what it's like. And the third component, uh, which I think uh, uh, really needs to be looked at, other than going up to per Portsmouth up there, which is a different state, is the fact that in the summer of 1781, as uh, French forces leave Williamsburg, to come up to eventually Boston, uh, Wadsworth hires uh, wagoners, but in order to do this, he uh, gets a subcontractor, and they are organized almost militarily with, with, with <coughs> military ranks, etc. And this whole wagon train uh, comes up to Boston, obviously, and there they are discharged. And that's not the problem. The much bigger problem that French officers have is before they embark is what? They have about 1,500 horses to get rid of. And you know what that does to prices? And the biggest buyer is then who? Come the army. Because there's finally a bunch of horses that they can afford in there. But the wagons, the, the hundreds of oxen, these 1,500 horses uh, eventually make their way across uh, across Massachusetts, uh, Sudbury, and they end up near Albany, way up there. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've seen in, in the Watchworth papers are the receipts. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a totally unknown track of, of forces and, and Cornell Army uh, troops then also accompanying them uh, that, I don't, that I certainly wasn't aware of. You know, of, uh, before I started this, uh, because of course they couldn't take their 1,500, 2,000 horses with them to Europe. And there's a bit of complaint saying I'm getting a quarter of what I paid for them, but that's mm -hmm. you know, some good Yankee capitalism right there. Uh, <laughs> they were somewhat used too, I would think. There were some <laughs> and, th and that was before the French started eating horses. Uh, so yeah. they, that only comes in the late 19th century. Yeah. Late 19th century. So there are still some, some of these component aspects in there that I would like to look at to get a, to get a broader picture. Because this is, this is not really military history. I mean, there's no, there's no battle fought here. Yeah, a couple of people are executed for all kinds of things. Uh, but it's much more social history. And it's much more uh, looking at accounts of, of how the sides see each other. There's some wonderful journals uh, in the Massachusetts Historical Society uh, usually if they're written by ministers, they're somewhat more hostile than, uh, than others. There's one by, by a Continental Army soldier that's on there, 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 uh, describing the, uh, the celebrations for the uh, birth of the Dauphin. He said, uh, our ancestors would be rolling over in the graves. <laughs> All this stuff about a little Catholic piccanini here. <laughs> so things, things like, like that. Uh, uh, as a as a as a uh, snapshot of 1782 mm -hmm. when French forces here uh, actually and hopefully obviously then how some of these prejudices are actually uh, disappear on a once we get a personal contact and 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 because there's so have so many examples for that when they say well when Lobadier goes through uh, travels to Connecticut. Uh, one of these Connecticut people says, you can't be French, you're much too white. Because uh, <laughs> you've got to be swarthy or something. Uh, I don't know. So those kind of uh, accounts, uh, because I think they are very important for the, uh, 
for the creation of this new republic because it's right at the very moment uh, of independent of, of winning the war. Yes, sir. So, is there any legacy <coughs> of the French left behind um, establishing businesses or or family names that we would now recognize that trace back to the, the French left behind that we stayed behind? Uh, there are too few of of them for that is concerned. Are any of them kind of? No. Uh, what what we have here are yet they married well or something. Yeah. Not not that I know. The only French uh, the only French deserter who did very well went to Indiana because the Paul University is named after him. Uh, uh, otherwise, they don't. Uh, uh, and and if we could continue with this, I have at least half a dozen or so applications by former deserters to the councils of France for permission to get back to France with a letter saying, you know, I know I deserted, but I changed my mind, kind of, mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing to show you that the difficult environment that this that we have, as far as as uh, trade connections are concerned, uh, there is a very it's a short-lived uh, French-American uh, trading company, 1787 or thereabouts, but it never got anywhere, not just because of the French Revolution, but because these colonies have had so much more in common with Britain. Uh, uh, language, <coughs> culture, family ties, established trade routes, the kind of goods that the colonies want are produced in England, not in France. And so it's not surprising that once peace is proclaimed in Philadelphia, the first vessels that sail in, sails into Philadelphia flies the Union Jack. It's just, it's just, it's it's normal almost that that uh, that Britannia and America would get back together again fairly quickly. Thomas Jefferson, notwithstanding. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. I could make one quick comment on the uh, famous Nathaniel Tracy dinner here with the Prague served. Um, Tracy was actually the guy who took Thomas Jefferson to France several years later mm -hmm. on a ship from Boston. And people aren't generally aware of that. Okay. I wasn't um, either. Okay, and then the other interesting thing is I'm actually from New Jersey, and I was driving along through Scotch Plains, New Jersey, where I grew up, and I see a W3R sign there, and I'm saying, well, I must be the only person I know who would know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a more detailed map of the New Jersey routes? And it's obviously more than one, I guess. Uh, but not only that, if you yeah. go to the... Uh, uh, to the WPR US website, there's a uh, three volume report. study. Yeah. Pardon? Your report. My report. Yeah, it's all on the three volumes with maps and, right. and what have you. Uh, uh, they're, they're pretty much all of them, those that have been re uh, uh, released, are all online. Uh, the one from Virginia hasn't been released yet, but it's it's uh, too detailed uh, and 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 maybe the same thing is a cottage industry down there. Uh, but the rest is all on on uh, line for you to look at. But when you do that, uh, please do keep in mind that some of them are 10 years old and they contain some things that I you know, wouldn't say anymore today or simply have been superseded because new information has come to light. If you don't know whether you're right or wrong, just publish it, right? <laughs> It doesn't take long and somebody will, will correct you. Uh, but it's all, I mean, since it was all financed with, with tax dollars or donations like yours, there's no copyright that I'm aware of. If there is, I'm sure not getting any checks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Any other question? Yeah. Um, I understand there were some a few French soldiers that applied for pensions from the United States. Yes, there are. If you go to the... Uh, if you go to the uh, to the fold three where all these pension applications are, they are there are quite a f there are quite a few of them. Uh, they were practically all of them were denied, right? Because they're not serving. Uh, they're not serving in a continental army. And the other the other big problem, of course, is they don't have any discharge papers. Right. And then the other thing was to address the issue on the financial and land and stuff. I think Louisiana was probably the last track after the diaspora in Canada of any French sort of holdings and any people that sort of 
wealth, you might say, would be located there um, before and after the sale, of course. And that's sort of your remnants, the sort of Cajun and whatever, because the diaspora was the first one in the U.S. It, you know, well, the Indians actually were yeah. probably part of the first, but still, you know, that's a big problem when it happened in Canada. But there is one interesting thing. There's one interesting uh, aspect to this, uh, and that is that uh, once the French Revolution broke out, yeah. uh, there's even a number of enlisted men who come back to the United States. Mm -hmm. One of them is the is the, the man who drew the painting of Boston. He ends up in as a Lutheran minister down in Whitfield, Virginia, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, he serves in the Dupont Regiment uh, as uh, the Catholic priest under the Dupont. Uh, regiment uh, uh, comes to Baltimore and then dies out in Kaskaskia as a missionary among the Indians. Uh, the Lutheran minister, on the other hand, becomes a Jacobin as the grandfather of Baron Hausmann of uh, rebuilding Paris. But uh, they are there are a number of examples uh, where uh, that I have when people then after they are discharged in Europe now they come back, especially once the, once the French Revolution breaks out mm -hmm. as well. So it's not all forgotten. Yeah? Yes. So how did Rochambeau do in the French Revolution? Uh, Roche, at the beginning of the French Revolution, uh, uh, he gets a command again, uh, but as the revolution becomes more and more radical, uh, being a nobleman uh, and a member of the Ancien Regime, he loses his position, he's, he's uh, arrested, uh, sentenced to death, uh, but the apocryphal story is that uh, as he is about to be uh, carried off, uh, uh, there's a lady lying ahead of him that says, after you, and she gets into the cart, and the trailer says, the coal cart is fully on the next load, and the next load was supposed to be the next day, and Rob Spear had, had fallen, and therefore, uh, you know, being polite, pays off. <laughs> I have no idea whether this is true, but it's a wonderful story. He dies very he dies very peacefully on his estate. Yes, sir. Uh, the Yorktown question. Uh, I've heard a number of different stories relating to the surrender of Cornwallis. And uh, one story is that he was sick, and um, Another is that he feigned sickness because he didn't want to surrender to Washington, and that he surrendered his sword to Cornwall to Rochambeau instead because he was the traditional arch enemy of England. Uh, first, the first question: I don't think Cornwallis was sick. He just really didn't want to come out and suffer the humiliation. <coughs> yeah. The uh, O'Hara, who comes and out instead, goes up to uh, 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 Rochambeau. Uh, because he really doesn't want to surrender to Washington because that also has in, uh, international law implications. Uh, so so Rochambeau uh, points him to Washington. Washington doesn't take it well to take the sword either because we're in a tit for tat and he points him over to Lincoln. And General Lincoln is the man who had to give his sword to O'Hara when he surrendered at Charleston. <coughs> So, uh, so we, you know, we do this, which is why we have the same surrender conditions, uh, uh, case flags, uh, etc. And so, and eventually, actually, he has to give his sword to the man who had a couple of years earlier in 1780 surrendered to him, actually only a good year earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. So the uh, disposition of British soldiers who surrendered at Yorktown, uh, I, I, I think they were led to internment camps, POW camps, unlike at Saratoga when they were when they were set free and or paroled rather. Well, uh, Saratoga <coughs> convention prisoners eventually end up in Charlottesville and then they end up they go up to to Lancaster. In in uh, the, the, the folks from from prisoners of war from Yorktown, uh, within two or three days they are on the way to uh, Frederick, Maryland and then Winchester and eventually in Lancaster from where they march directly to New York and sail, and mm -hmm. sail home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was wondering if you could sort of give us the picture from the French government standpoint. In other words, they made a, a troop commitment, I guess you're saying around 12,000 people. 
and uh, troops. And did, was that felt to be the right number, or was there pressure to send more? And in terms of why they were doing it, what were their sort of strategic objectives? Were they, uh, in other words, did they believe, for example, that the, that ultimately America would be sort of a lucrative ally, or did they was it expecting it to be a drain for a while? How did they perceive their commitment? Uh, okay. In, in, if I may answer the second question first, the whole strategic uh, picture is based on on the fact that France is, is a continental power. A continental power that looks eastward. <coughs> and a continental power that sees uh, the biggest enemy and threat to Western civilization in Russia. French foreign policy since the days of Peter the Great or Louis XIV has as its ultimate goal uh, a uh, cordon sanitaire, whatever you want to call it, of keeping Russia landlocked, uh, Peter from St. Petersburg. And this goes through centuries all the way. Uh, and so therefore, this is the French position. But the French, and while, while Britain on the other hand is a maritime power looking across the ocean. In order to keep Russia, uh, keep Russia uh, uh, landlocked, uh, you need two things. You need an army and a navy. The French have the army, and they have the Polish support, the Poles are Catholic, for example, etc., but you don't have a navy. In order, to, uh, in order to get this navy, you have to get Britain to play its role on the European continent as a European power. At 1763, the end of the Seven Years' War, this European balance of power has been, powers has been greatly upset because there's only one world power left, and that's Great Britain, which is one of the reasons why nobody else comes to the assistance of Britain when these colonies here rebel, because they want to get Britain back into this, uh, into this family of nations, into this balance of powers. The other aspect is and how French is thinking, and it's important that Vercheng, the French foreign minister, before that was almost 10 years uh, French ambassador to Istanbul, Constantinople. So he, he is deeply entrenched in this whole thinking, <coughs> this is what Lafayette is in there, in this whole group of foreign policy advisors. Anyway, and the idea then is that in order to, to turn Great Britain to look eastward on the continent rather than westward, we have to detach the Britain from the most important reason why they're looking westward. Mm -hmm. And those are these colonies over here. Mm -hmm. The idea is, is when if Great Britain loses these colonies, she will look, become a continental power. Again, she will no longer be the primus in the paris, but one, uh, <coughs> one of the five great powers, and then will uh, you know will uh, will play this part in French foreign policy that the French would like them to mm. play. There's nothing uh, uh, there's nothing as far as the French wanting Canada back or any of this. That, that's not that's not in there uh, at all. It's just larger strategic outlook in what is what is a European centered world. I mean, I mean, Western Massachusetts is on the fringes of civilization <laughs> in 1781. Uh, it's a European-centered uh, world where, where, and this is what, what the French really are, unlike Great Britain. And ever so often, Britain does play the role that France wants them to do, but it doesn't go too well in the Crimean <coughs> War, it doesn't work out in the Suez Crisis, it doesn't work out in the First World War, it doesn't work out. Uh, so this is this back and forth. Uh, in there. Uh, the other question was what? The first question? Well, I just wondered if the amount of troop commitment. Oh, the troop or commitment. Uh, well, the troop commitment originally had been about 12,000. Mm -hmm. uh, but then two <coughs> things happened. A, we have a, a revolt in Corsica uh, in 1779, uh, 1780, so the French wanted to keep some of their troops home. And the other thing that happened is this friendship, they don't have enough shipping space. Uh, they don't simply don't have enough shipping space to bring that many. The Americans always want more, obviously. Uh, and then comes Yorktown, and once Yorktown has happened and, and American independence is pretty much assured, 
then the focus of the war changes. The focus of the war shifts for Britain, and the focus of the war shifts for France. Because Britain realizes that it's lost, this continent is going to become independent. And Africa realizes if we keep pouring resources <coughs> into these colonies or into the United States, we risk losing something that's much more valuable to us, namely Jamaica, the Sugar Islands. Hmm. Uh, and France, and France does the same thing. France says, okay, uh, the colonies are going to be independent. We did what we promised the Americans what we would do. Now what's in it for us? We don't want Canada. And there's beavers and ice and what have you. Uh, as, as Voltaire says. Uh, but there's, there's money, there's the real wealth is in the Caribbean. Right? And it's, and it's in this context uh, that uh, the Battle of the Saints takes place in, in April of 1782. It's Admiral de Grasse with a fleet on his way to invade Jamaica, which is the, the crown jewel in the Caribbean for Great Britain. So the whole focus shifts. If, if uh, this War of Independence had been the French role in the War of Independence before then, had been driven by European foreign policy considerations for France. Af after Yorktown, it's driven by, by Caribbean, uh, French and British interests in there. This, this war over here is really only a sideshow. Uh, if you look at the total expenses <coughs> of uh, Rochambeau's uh, expedition here, it's about 15 million <coughs> The whole war costs over a billion. Mm -hmm. It's it's you know it's a rounding error almost uh, the expenses that we have over here in the in the overall in the overall war. The reason why nobody uh, uh, talks about these other uh, aspects and these other components is because we really don't care whether Gibraltar is Spanish or British, right? Mm -hmm. And Senegal is long since independent and India <coughs> is independent and. And you know who cares about the Jersey Islands unless you have a couple million dollars you want to hide somewhere? Uh, the global, the world political consequences of the United States becoming independent are so much more important. Why? Why? Even in India, it's called the War of American Independence, even though they are <coughs> convoys goes to India. <coughs> the war goes on until 1789. There are as many Hanoverians in India as there are Hessians over here uh, in the United States, but. Uh, but it's really not that important in, in, the, in, the, in the overall, in the global uh, picture of what's, what's going uh, uh, on here. So, uh, uh, so uh, as the war shifts then uh, to the Caribbean, which is always what the French were more in, most interested in anyway, because uh, Savannah is when? <coughs> September, October, right? 1779. Newport is September 78. Yorktown is October 81. The French are only up here with their fleets when? When it's hurricane season right. down there. They need to get out of the way. That's when they show up here. But because the, what's really where the money is being made is down there. Because what do they grow in Connecticut? <coughs> Mostly rocks, right? <laughs> 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 but, and tobacco, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, uh, I know that I'm, I'm over over playing this here, but uh, and then Connecticut is important to feed the colonies down there and the wheat from Maryland and all that. But but the British realized very quickly <coughs> the war. Hey, we can always buy this stuff from them. It's cheaper because if they lose their ships, it's their problem, not ours, <laughs> right? It's just that they learned this a little. Uh, too late by 1781, they have to do that. Yep. Um, who had oversight of the campaigns of Pensacola and Savannah <coughs> in the Caribbean and the, the regiments from the French army that came up and the French Navy uh, from the Caribbean essentially to support those campaigns? Uh, was that Destang who was in charge of uh, the Destang is gone already in okay. 70, in 79. <coughs> uh, they skull based in 1780. Okay. But, yeah, it's a Spanish enterprise. Uh, and expensive. Pardon? Not very successful, but expensive. Uh, There's two seizures. Uh, it all depends. The, the, the Connell army, the 
colonists benefit from it because Britain has to divert resources somewhere else. It's diversion, yeah. yeah, divert resources. Well, when I said it would be lovely if you stayed as long as you wanted to, <laughs> I said that I appreciated uh, the richness of your knowledge and the enormous interest of this audience in that knowledge. So we